Okay, good afternoon. My name is Howard Glazer. I'm Director of State Operations for New York State. We're joined today by, of course, Governor Cuomo, by MTA Chairman Tom Prendergast, and by TWU Local 100 President John Samuelson. Over the last three and a half years, Governor Cuomo has settled labor contracts covering 180,000 state employees. He's been called in to help settle private labor management disputes, including the Con Ed lockout in the summer of 2012. He's always brought the same simple principles, protect the taxpayers, and create a fair deal for the workers. This has resulted in state labor contracts with a 2% cap on increases, with increased health care contributions by employees, which have saved substantial sums for taxpayers, but also included improvements to benefits and conditions for employees. The governor's brought those same principles to the longstanding dispute over two years now between the MTA and the TWU. The MTA and TWU have been unable to reach agreement for a protracted period of time, bringing uncertainty both financial and operational to the MTA, to the ridership, and to the employees. In recent days, the union and the management have intensified discussions but been unable to reach agreement on critical items. Late yesterday, President Samuelson sent a letter to the governor asking him to get involved, as the governor has in other public and private labor disputes. The governor agreed, not least of which because of the importance of MTA uh, to the state. The state provides $4.3 billion in, uh, in operational subsidy to the MTA, an increase of $85 million last year, which is a historic amount that any governor has provided to the MTA. Discussions at the staff level were held uh, last night and continued today directly with the governor. The governor asked President Samuelson and uh, Chairman Prendergast to meet him here at the governor's office today. The governor's involvement in these talks today has resulted uh, in a tentative agreement, which meets the principles of fiscal discipline and fairness to employees that the governor has laid out. Any agreement is subject to board and union approval. Chairman Prendergast uh, will take you through some of the highlights, followed by uh, President Sam, Sam, uh, Samuelson to talk through some of the details from his point of view, and then we'll hear from the governor. Doctor. Thank you very much, Howard. Uh, it was a long negotiation, and I agree with Howard with all of his comments. What we have here is a fair wage settlement for employees. Most importantly, no impact on fares, and it's an agreement that is consistent with our financial plan and outline. Uh, it's a fiscally responsible agreement with the wage increases within the caps that are mandated by the governor of the state of New York within 2%. And it involves increased uh, health care contributions and impl improved employee benefits. John? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom. And I want to thank the governor as well for intervening in the negotiation. It's been a very long two years, a two year fight. So the union believes that we've achieved um, many of the goals that we set out to achieve wage increases in every year of the deal, um, no zeros, full retroactive pay other economic improvements for our members as well. Uh, perhaps most importantly, significant new <coughs> benefits for our members, uh, never, be seen benef never seen before benefits, including paid maternity leave and paid paternity leave. Um, significantly improved optical and dental benefits. We were able to fix a lot of the inequities in our health benefit plan that have been nagging us for the last couple of decades. So overall, um, as has been said, the union has to bring this deal in front of our executive board, and I would be hesitant to go into a lot more details than I went into before we seek ratification of my executive board. So again, I appreciate it, Governor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you. Uh, first, to uh, Chairman Tom Prendergast, I wanted to uh, thank him and applaud him for a good piece of work here. As you know, the MTA is uh, vitally important. To New York State. It's basically the circulatory system for downstate New York. Its performance, its operation, its safety uh, is truly paramount. In some ways, the MTA is right now going through probably the most difficult period they've had uh, in decades, uh, arguably since they've been created. Uh, we have new challenges now, what we call the new normal. Uh, what we've learned from the weather patterns and the changing weather patterns and the floods and the storms, et cetera. MTA is going through a new reinvention, really, a new retrofitting, rethinking how they operate. So it's a tremendously challenging time for the MTA, uh, and they are vitally important to, uh, to the state of New York. This agreement uh, is a fair agreement from the MTA's uh, point of view. 
which again, it has to be ratified by the MTA board. But importantly, there will be no fair increases due to this uh, contract negotiation. And it is in keeping with the MTA's long-term financial plan. And that is, that is very important to the uh, users of the MTA. Uh, President John Samuelson is a uh, phenomenal labor leader. I've worked with many. Uh, and he is truly a tough, tough negotiator on behalf of his union, as he should be. Uh, and I want to applaud him on this contract and on these terms. Uh, it's, it's fair on the financial terms. I think it's also innovative in some of the developments for the employees and their families that takes into consideration the challenges that people are facing today. Uh, and I applaud him on a piece of work uh, well done. I also applaud the transit workers who have done a great job. Uh, they are the epitome of great public servants. Uh, what they did during Hurricane Sandy, I watched firsthand under truly difficult circumstances. And they were there day after day after day, day in and day out, dealing with things no one had ever seen before. You never saw flooding of tunnels before. You never saw flooding of subway systems before the way we saw it. Uh, and the transit workers were really uh, magnificent. I also want to thank Howard Glazer and Vincent Pitta, who were very instrumental in working through uh, what was a very difficult situation. This contract negotiation went on for two years, so you know it wasn't easy. Uh, two years is a long time. Uh, but uh, it was hard. It was hard on both sides. And as I said, I think it's a, a fair resolution on both sides. It is not final until it's final. And I've been around long enough to know it's not done until it's done. And uh, the MTA board has to vote before it's done for the MTA. And uh, President Samuelson's board has to ratify it. Uh, and then it has to be uh, actually decided by the union. But uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Uh, I think it's, it is uh, a contract that should be accepted by both parties. Uh, and I also believe it's in the best interest of the people of the state of New York. With that, uh, I am going to pass this over. Mr. Chairman, first, your signature. Congratulations, gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Job well done. I hope it gets ratified. It's a pleasure to have an agreement that, that I don't have to sign, frankly. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, can you describe the raises that people are getting in? Can you talk about why there were retroactive raises? Uh, Chairman, do you want to do it? Sure. Or? The raises are 1% uh, in the first year, 1% in the second year, and 2% in, in each of the final three years. Uh, I think the union negotiated from the uh, start that they were very important in the red raises being retroactive uh, for a number of reasons. And when we have contracts that went past the, uh, the, end, the, the start date, that's the position they've taken. So that was a position they took throughout this. Yes. Increase in health care contributions from one and a half to two percent. Uh, for the uh, 40 hours of work for all employees. So, the you know, I think uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, I've been through a number of situations like this one, and uh, we just finished a, a budget negotiation in Albany, which is sort of the mother of all negotiations. I don't think there is a final straw. It, you reach a point where it's sort of all or nothing. You reach a point where either the parties are willing to be reasonable on a number of points, and uh, there's a give and a take. It normally doesn't come down to one. It comes down to it happens when people want it to happen. And there's a sense of trust in the room and trust in the relationship. 
where if someone gives on one point, there'll be reciprocity on another point. Uh, and I think that's what happened in this situation. Either of you want well, to I think it's like the governor said, you know, when, you, when you're in negotiation, you have a series of issues that you're bargaining for. And you may ask for something on one and be willing to give on another. And as the governor said earlier, the deal's not done till the deal's done. So you're not necessarily looking at any one, one, any one of those items as being the show. It's the sum of them. Because if, if I'm willing to move on one issue and John's willing to move on another issue and then the momentum gets to the point where you get critical mass, and you get an agreement, and that's the way it happens. So it's truly no one issue. Uh, but, you know, there's some, you know, for the period of time that we were negotiating and for the, the difficult financial times we were under a number of years back, uh, those all contributed to it. But we got to a point, to, you know, within the last uh, 48 hours where we could get there, and we got there. Parties become frozen in place. You know, it's, um, uh, again, there, there's always a give and a take, but people are afraid to give because they don't know if there's going to be reciprocity. So it's, it's getting past that point. And it really is more about uh, trust. And then there's also a, a sense of when people are ready to actually get it done. After two years, people were ready to get it done. To the extent there was uh, trust in the relationship and fairness and a general sense of um, of mutuality and reciprocity. I think that's that's what actually made this cross the, the finish line. Again, it, it has to be ratified by the MTA board, uh, which is an independent board. It has to be ratified by the union. Can you describe how this, uh, this deal will affect the MTA's overall finances? There have been a lot of things that have happened throughout the year during the budget process. The Cap and Z uh, deal bears uh, $30 million that the, the state used from the MTA. How is this deal going to affect the MTA's budget process? Well, the two most important things are we've made commitments, and you've seen the dialogue when we have the budget presented at the end of the year and at the half-year mark in July we talk about how we're doing well against the budget. And the two things that are very important to the board members and to the, to the union as well as to the, uh, to the customers are this will no impact on fares. It's consistent with our financial plan for, with that respect. And also we're, in a, we're, we're, we're trying to put back some of those services that were taken away in 2010 as well as add new services as the city changes. And so those were two things that were very important to us, and this plan does not affect either one of those things. And that's why it's important that we say that. Uh, this is for, I guess, for Tom. Uh, there had been the, the pledge to not uh, to have the projected fare increase. Is that just for next year? What about beyond that? I mean, if you take a look at what we've been reporting on, and we have a four-year financial plan, so we're always looking ahead four years, up to this point in time, we've had fare increases every two years. For the last financial plan that we presented, which was approved at the board in December of 2013, we had a fare increase scheduled in 2015 and a fare increase scheduled in 2017. This is consistent with that, and the fare increase is at the same level. It has not increased. It's the same level. If we do better in finances, we'd be look at that, but it has no impact to the plan as it, as it is in place right now. Historically, in, uh, in, in the transit side, uh, which includes all the MTA agencies, uh, we follow pattern bargaining. So uh, generally speaking, historically, if you look back a long period of time, the first deal that was closed was with the Transport Workers, workers Union. It's the largest union. And then it helps establish a pattern in terms of how the others will follow. So it will be along the same lines. But we're in the middle of a process right now, which is a federally mandated process. And we're going to be consistent with that process. And that, that's about as much as I say because we've been asked to, to, to basically follow that process and not talk a lot about it at this point in time. No specific work world changes. Well, we're not at three zeros, uh, but we've got a deal that lives within the within the financial plan. So that, that and that's the most important thing. Well, some of the raises are paid for, but the it was clear that we needed to reach an agreement that provided for fair wage settlements and increases for the employees, but still within the context of our financial plan. Uh, 
Uh, no, I think these are they are separate situations, uh, and the mayor will negotiate his contract separately. Well, I think the uh, we are at a different time. You know, when you negotiate a contract, you negotiate a contract in that economic circumstance. Uh, this state was in a much, much different economic circumstance four years ago. Uh, I became governor. I walked in the door. We had a $10 billion deficit. Uh, today, the state has basically a $2 billion surplus. So that is a much, much different situation, I can tell you that. I can't give it off the top of my head, but it would be the effect of those particular wage increases by year compounded out. That's how you'd run that number. I don't have them off the top of my head, but it's within the financial envelope. That I know, because whenever we do collect a bargaining, we want to make sure we, we stay within the parameters of the financial envelope in terms of what labor costs would be for the terms of that four-year financial plan. Let me say one last point. The, uh, this went on for two years, as we mentioned before. Uh, two years is a long time, and I want to applaud both these gentlemen, because what happens is people get into a pattern, and in some ways it's easy to keep fighting. Um, the agreement has the risk, right? Because when you reach an agreement, that's when you can be second-guessed on the agreement. Uh, so the, the initial uh, incentives are just keep fighting, just keep saying no, stay frozen in place. That way, everybody loses. That is a sure way for everyone to lose. You know, we talk about gridlock in a political context. There's also gridlock in a private party context. Uh, and that's what was going on for two years. And these two gentlemen were willing to step up and uh, take the risk of trusting the other party and having a fruitful discussion and coming up with a fair agreement for all. So I applaud them. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to be with us.